Silvergate is no more. The crypto banking giant has decided to wind down in an orderly fashion. And I just got done recording today's podcast episode that's all about this, but I wanted to do a version for YouTube as well. And today what I want to talk about is what are the possible explanations for this? And to what extent Silvergate's failure has to do with one, the inevitable byproduct of being a banker for the crypto industry, as Elizabeth Warren would have us believe. Two, how much it had to do with specific decisions they made around their balance sheet. Three, how much it had to do with a coordinated political campaign against them, perpetrated by both short sellers as well as members of the Senate. So before we get into all of that, it's important to have just a little bit of context on who Silvergate was and why they were such an important part of the crypto industry. Effectively, this was a small community bank that had had very few deposits and only two or three locations for most of its life, but in 2016 looked around and noticed that no one was willing to bank crypto companies, and so maybe they would. Uh, as Austin Campbell here put it, for those who don't know, Silvergate was one of the banks that was an early supporter of the crypto industry. And by supporter, I mean merely a bank that did not aggressively turn away crypto clients. I think his best line is here. Considering that most of the banking industry had reacted to crypto about the same way someone would react to a person running up and shitting on their porch, this was actually quite remarkable. So that was Silvergate. It started very small, but very quickly when no other banks would work with crypto clients, Crypto came a-knocking, and Silvergate's bank deposits rose, right? So that was sort of the state of play. Huge, huge growth for Silvergate in 2018, 2019, 2020, and certainly 2021. Uh, they introduced innovations like the Silvergate Exchange Network, which allowed clients of the bank to real-time settle things even after uh, market hours, which is huge for the crypto industry. And so they were going to always be a little bit more susceptible to turmoil in the crypto industry because it was such a huge part of their business. I think at peak, something like 90% of their deposits were from the crypto industry. And so this came home to roost this year, or last year rather, excuse me, in the wake of the collapse of FTX. There was at that time a huge exodus from the crypto industry from people taking their money off of exchanges, many of whom banked at Silvergate, and trading firms withdrawing their funds from the industry, again, many of whom banked at Silvergate. And so coming into Q4 of last year, Silvergate had something like $12 billion in deposits, and they saw an $8 billion bank run, which it should be noted wasn't a bank run against Silvergate in the sense that uh, it reflected a loss of confidence in Silvergate itself, but it was sort of a proxy bank run as money left the crypto industry. Now, during this time, Silvergate had taken on a loan from the Federal Home Loan Bank. This is a bank that historically was used to backstop smaller institutions that were doing mortgage type lending. And so it was certainly a little bit out of sync for perhaps the intended purpose of this thing, which was starting during the Great Depression. But Silvergate was a full member of this association. It didn't do anything wrong in asking for this loan. And it was really a question of just how politically controversial it would be. Well, it turns out it was extremely politically controversial. Silvergate, during this time, during December and January, was really hearing it from all sides. They were hearing it from senators as related to what they knew about FTX and Alameda Research, which, by the way, I think is a completely reasonable line of questioning. Uh, but they were also hearing it around this FHLB loan. And I think that in t on top of these sort of very public letters that were undermining consumer confidence in the bank, Silvergate was dealing with an extremely aggressive campaign from short sellers. By February, Silvergate was the second most shorted stock in the U.S. So you have this real confluence of things. You have genuine issues in the crypto industry. You have concentration risk because so much of Silvergate, their deposit base is the crypto industry. But then you also have this intense political campaign from politicians and from short sellers to undermine Silvergate. And ultimately, they just couldn't, uh, they couldn't handle it. They, they collapsed. Now, there are many of these politicians who are sort of dancing on the grave of Silvergate now and making it seem as though it was an inevitable byproduct of the crypto industry. And that's just not the case. 
Certainly, we can and should have a conversation, one, about what Silver Bank, Silvergate Bank did or didn't know as relates to FTX and Alameda. I think to the extent that they were complicit in that, they need to be punished appropriately. But that's not the crypto industry. That's a fraud, a fraud that SBF is soon to be on trial for and faces 165 years in prison for. That's different than this being a problem of the quote unquote crypto industry. I think it's also reasonable to ask whether there should be a different set of rules for deposits around the crypto industry held with banks because of the particular nature of the crypto industry. There are tons of folks who are willing to have that conversation. Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, said so on Odd Lots the other day. Caitlin Long, the CEO of Custodia Bank, is explicitly trying to get her bank, a full reserve bank, to become part of the Federal Reserve System so that she can bank crypto companies in a way that is full reserve, that doesn't loan out their deposits at all, even to these very sort of unrisky types of ventures like mortgage-backed securities that Silvergate was invested in. Still, even with all that, Silvergate Bank was well within the normal band of the types of commercial activities that fractional reserve banks take. They weren't playing crazy gambling games like something like Celsius was. And that brings us, I think, to this third question or this third idea of to what extent there was specific political collusion. And I think Ram Alawalia really did a good job writing this up. So I'm going to quote from him. He wrote, excuse me, guys. Silvergate, the first crypto bank, faced a bank run that led to its downfall. Despite facing allegations around AML, it was not these issues that ultimately caused the demise of Silvergate. The responsibility for bank supervision lies with the executive branch, but this process was cut short. A senator's letter, amplified by social media, undermined public trust in Silvergate, ultimately leading to a crisis of confidence. It is important to uphold the principle of due process. Silvergate was denied due process. The senator's allegations should not be used to justify the destruction of a Federal Reserve member bank in a 120-character Twitter thread. Let's get the first draft of history correct. I think this is incredibly important because I also agree with Scott Melker here when he says Silvergate's collapse is exactly the ammo the government needs to try to cut the crypto industry off from the banking system. I think that to the extent that there are blood on there is Silvergate's blood on the hands of these politicians who pushed so hard to undermine confidence in it, or perhaps who explicitly tried to push the FHLB to recall that loan, which ended up being sort of the death knell for Silvergate. It's exactly what they wanted. This is a group who does not believe that crypto should have access to the banking system. And that is the battle that we have coming. Anyways, guys, if you are interested in this topic, I think it's a pretty big moment for the industry, and I go much more in depth on today's show, which will be out in a couple hours or already is out, uh, depending on when you're seeing this. Thanks for listening, and uh, look forward to chatting more with all of you about this.